All right. All right, so welcome to a weekend workshop intro to JavaScript. Uh, before we get started, I want to run through the agenda and talk about what we're going to discuss. Uh, first, we're going to go over uh, why JavaScript. Um, I got answers from all of you in the emails about why you wanted to learn JavaScript, but we're going to talk about why it's taking over everything in IT right now. Uh, then we're going to go through different tools and setup, and then we're going to actually go into the language. We're not going to cover everything in the language. We're going to cover the core of what we need to know to start writing applications. Um, then we're going to go kind of outside of JavaScript into HTML and the document object model. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at jQuery. I wanted this class to be the basics of JavaScript, but jQuery is one of those frameworks that has become so ubiquitous that it's almost core to JavaScript. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go into web services and ways you can use um, JavaScript to access outside data from other applications. Uh, so to start with, let's just talk about why JavaScript. Why is JavaScript becoming so popular? Um, it's, um, it can be run in phones. It can be run in the web browser. It's now being run on web servers. Uh, it's really uh, infiltrating every area of our systems. I think there's really two reasons that it's become so popular over the last few years. And that's um, it's native to the web, uh, and it's very simple. So when I say native to the web, what do I mean? JavaScript is an open standard. Uh, it's based on something called ECMAScript, which I think stands for European Computer Manufacturing Association. OK, thank you. Uh, script. Uh, and in the early days of the internet, all these different browser vendors were looking at um, some sort of general purpose programming language to put in their browsers. Uh, and there was um, a couple different ideas. Java was proposed. VBScript was proposed. Um, everyone now has landed on JavaScript or ECMAScript as the open standard. Uh, and um, going forward, every vendor looks at that um, standard and implements it in a consistent way, or at least tries to implement it in a consistent way. There's little variations between browsers, but that's gotten significantly better over the last few years. Uh, what's also interesting about this idea of an open standard is um, there have been attempts by each of these vendors to create their own proprietary standards. So you probably remember Flash which got pretty close to being ubiquitous and used throughout. Um, that's gone away with phones and uh, other devices. Uh, Microsoft had uh, something called Silverlight that they tried to push. But really, nothing that has been proprietary by a vendor has taken off. Um, there's this agreement that the web needs to be about open standards. OK, and it's also simple. So what do I mean by simple? First of all, it's a dynamic language. Um, if we were doing a, a statically typed language or something that needed to be compiled, we'd spend the rest of this class installing compilers and runtimes and integrated development environments. JavaScript doesn't need to do any of that. It's just interpreted. So we can, you can just use your browser as the platform. Um, yeah, so the runtime is your browser. It also has a small set of commands. It's not an overly complex language. Uh, some of the languages that have been around for a long time have had features introduced uh, over time and become very bloated and complex. Uh, JavaScript is, is, is very simple in the actual syntax and language. So even though it's simple, it's one of those things that you can learn the, the basic rules of it in one day, but it really takes a lifetime to master. So um, like chess, chess you can learn in one day, um, but it takes years and years of doing it all the time to really become an expert. I feel it's the same way about JavaScript. I'm always learning, I'm always looking back a year or two years ago and thinking, man, I didn't know what I was doing. But I'm always thinking that. So it's something that you can never really become um, the best at. You're always continually improving. OK, so let's talk about what you guys are going to need to follow along in these exercises. Um, if you have a text editor, um, that's fine. You don't need one. Uh, you do need a browser, though. Uh, I prefer Chrome, and I'm going to be doing all of my examples in Chrome. So if you don't have that, you may want to download it. Um, you can use your browser as well. Um, I just happen to like the developer tools in Chrome. I think, they're, um, I think it's the best one out there right now. And then the examples that we're going to look at are on JS Fiddle. So um, for you to download um, the examples and interact with them, um, we're going to be using jsfiddle.net. And I think I have a URL to the examples we're going to use in this class. So um, go ahead and visit this right now. And maybe bookmark it or just keep it open in a tab. So as we're going through these examples, um, you can refer to them. 
And again, this is, um, these are examples I've put out there. You can actually execute them and edit them and change them, and it won't save them. It'll just be your private instance. So feel free to experiment as much as you want. I'll give you a second to, to navigate to there. Are we good to proceed slides? Has everyone got it? Okay, good. Okay, so let's start with just like the most basic hello world that we can. So uh, hello world is just a concept in programming of the most simple thing you can make to have an application run. So if you're doing it in a text editor, um, you can create an HTML file. Um, in most of the email responses I got from the group, it sounded like everyone had done HTML, but not yet JavaScript. So I'm, not, I'm gonna um, gloss over a lot of the HTML stuff and assume you have a basic understanding of HTML. Um, but you, don't ha you can do this in JS Fiddle. So you can either create a file, um, save it as um, program.html, and then create a JS file in the same directory called uh, program.js. If you open your HTML file, you should get an alert. And if you're in JS Fiddle, you just have to type alert hello world. No, I don't, no, you can, you can just do it right uh, in the, so there's a, in JS Fiddle, that's a, actually a good question, I'll show you real quick. So here's probably what you see when you went to JS Fiddle, is that accurate? I went to the user Josh R. Harrison. So go to the cloud thing on the left here. Okay. And keep that Josh R. Harrison link handy though, because we're, gonna, that's, those are going to be the saved examples. Okay, cool, yeah, now I see the screen. Okay, perfect. So if you're in JS Fiddle, let's just do a, um, the JavaScript panels in the bottom left corner. And let's just run that. And for some reason that didn't work, which is great. Let's actually go into the developer tool. So if you have Chrome, um, if you have a PC, I think it's F12 to get into the developer tools. And if you have a Mac, um, you can get it to it from the menu or that control, or that Shortcut right there. Good question. Oh, there you go. I've learned something today. Nice. <laughs> okay, so um, you'll notice in the bottom uh, bottom part of the screen here, I have this console. So I'll just do something intentionally. Um, let's say I'm going to create a, well, let's just put some stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah, mine did after, I think, the screen, I think it was just loading. So you'll see I get an uncaught syntax error here. Um, that just tells me something's wrong. So this should, this looks like valid. Okay, great. All right, let's go back into the slides now. Okay. So we went, you saw the developer tools. That was an example of that. Was everyone able to access the developer tools? That's very important because if you, can't get into the developer tools, you're blind as to what your program's doing. There's a really useful um, debugging tool. So I never use alerts ever. It's called console.log, and it will print whatever you put into it. So that's useful if you have a variable or um, something's doing something weird and you want to see the actual value of it. And when I do that, I'll actually see it in my console. So I use the word variable. What did I mean by that? So let's start with variables. Variables are like the basic construct of all JavaScript programs. They're really the building blocks of creating a program. Uh, variables hold values so that you can then do something with that value uh, and <coughs> make something useful of your program. So here's an example of a variable called initial number, and it's storing the value 10. We then are taking that initial number and adding 5 to it and storing it in a new variable sum. So let's really quickly go back into JS Fiddle, create a variable, 
called initial number, set it to 10. Um, let's create another variable called sum and add initial number to, or add five to the initial number. And then let's log the result of sum. So here we're seeing an example of variables and debugging and console logging. Does anyone see what's going on? Oh, it's not good. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, good call. So that's actually a good point. Um, so the console is interactive. So um, I can create variables in the console. Are you connected to the internet? Is, I wonder if you're having connectivity issues as well. He's reading, right? I seem to be connected now. So do you have the same? Uh, uh, you never hit your button, huh? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, you hit this run in the upper left. What is it, WebAssembly? It's supposed to be like a uh, JavaScript is really big right now, but the problem with JavaScript is it kind of lives in the browser. Mm -hmm. WebAssembly is supposed to somehow make it more, it, 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 it expands the environment, I guess. OK. Uh, so it runs outside the browser? It can. So, that, so, so JavaScript can run in the browser, but like Node.js? is an example of JavaScript running on the server side. JavaScript is really just a general purpose programming language. It's become popular because of the browser, but it's not limited to the browser. So that what you're talking about is probably another example of, run, of a platform that runs JavaScript outside the browser. Yep, yeah, JavaScript should never have a compiler. It's, it's a dynamic interpreted language. So even Node is that way. Node doesn't compile it, it interprets it. So it's similar to like a Ruby. Will we be jumping into Node? Uh, so in the second, um, so next week, I'm going to, I have some content laid out, but I'm going to get some feedback and see if there's any direction you guys want to take it. So that could be something we look at. OK, so um, that's an example of variables. I eventually connected back to the internet. That's an example of variables, console log, and JS Fiddle. OK, so that's really basic. So what can you actually store in a variable? Uh, there's really only about seven different types of values that you can store in a variable. Um, let's first start with the primitive types. And by primitive types, I mean it can't be broken down any further. It's almost like an atom of JavaScript. Uh, and there's really only five primitive types. And two of those primitive types, null and undefined, basically mean nothing. We'll go into what they actually mean and the differences between them. So really, there's only three types that hold a value that can be stored, primitive types that can be stored in, within a JavaScript variable. And that's a string, a number, and a Boolean. Uh, by Boolean, I mean true and false. Number is, you saw an example of a number. And string is just a string of characters. Uh, on top of those, those simple types or primitive types, we have more complex types, which are composed of those simple types. So we'll take a look at objects and arrays. 
So an object is really a key value pair that's storing primitive variables. Um, here's an example of a uh, coffee object that has some uh, properties on it. Uh, some are Boolean, some are character strings, some are numbers. Others are um, an example of an object. So uh, the, the, it's called JavaScript object notation is what we're using right now. I think it's another reason why JavaScript has become so popular because it's a very um, easy to read syntax. Um, this syntax has actually infiltrated data access. So um, if you've heard of Ajax, um, it uses JavaScript object notation. Config files now use uh, JavaScript object notation. Um, it's really becoming widely used. So it's, you do open close bracket, and then you create your um, whatever objects you want in it. So I think um, in my example here, I had, um, and the properties are separated by commas. Um, we can create a Boolean. Um, oh, actually. We'll create a number. Okay, let's just stop there to make it really simple. So let's say I want to, let's say I'm farther along in my application. I want to know, okay, I have this coffee object, but what's actually inside of it? You can do console.log coffee. I'm going to get rid of everything else I did here. And here I actually see the properties that are in that object. This is really useful in JavaScript because, because it's a, uh, let, me, let me give you an example. Because it's a dynamic language, I can add properties to coffee at will. Uh, so, um, so sometimes you, you have an object and you don't know what other things in the program have added or removed from it, and you need to see what's actually in that object and inspect it. And that's exactly what console.log and the uh, developer tools are used for. So it gives you a lot of insight into the data of your application. Questions on objects? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking because it was kind of like when it pops up, it kind of looks like an array. Yeah, so, okay, let's go into arrays and then we'll talk about the differences between objects and arrays because they're used for uh, different scenarios. So, an array is more like a list of things that you want to iterate through or change and manipulate. Um, the way you create an array is with the square brackets instead of the curly brackets. So, in the JS Fiddle dashboard, um, if you, under the um, link I gave initially, there's an arrays um, link, so you don't have to type all this stuff out anymore. So we'll go to that first. So in the JS Fiddle, yeah, go to that link, that, uh, the one that had Josh R. Harrison. I did, <laughs> yeah. It's in the Slack channel. Do you have that link? I can go back in the slides if you need it. Did I post it in the wrong spot? Okay. Thank you. So there, once you get there, there should be a uh, fiddle called arrays. I'll wait until you post that in the Slack channel. No, you can run it there, actually. So before you run it, kind of take a look at the, uh, at the code and guess what's going to come out to the console log. Yep. Well, so, so this is important. Arrays have special properties on them. Length is one of those properties. Um, so at first I say, okay, I make an array of cities. And now I'm asking how many um, 
elements are in that array. I, I log that out. Then I take the, the first element. So to understand um, array indexes, it's zero through the number of elements in the array. So I'm saying, give me the zeroth city, print that out. Uh, and then I'm saying, OK, overwrite the zeroth city with Columbus. So let's just start, let's start there. Let's not get into this, this looping stuff yet. Actually, let me comment this out entirely. Oh, and if you're doing multi-line comments, it's forward slash star, star forward slash. Yeah, commenting out more than one line at once. I don't, I don't know if JS Fiddle has that. Most editors have that, though. OK, so I'm going to run this. So it's telling me my uh, array length is, is six elements, that the zeroth element is initially Boston, is initially New York, and I'm then changing it to Columbus. And I could, I'll, I'll output. There should be a run. Okay, so now I changed that, that, that first element of that array to Columbus, and then I just printed it out to prove that it actually changed. So that's kind of changing reading and editing individual elements within an array. So that's kind of interesting. But what arrays are, the real power of arrays is that you can loop through them. So let's take a look at that real quick. So this looping construct is uh, sort of a fundamental element of all programming uh, languages. So here I'm saying, this is called a for loop. In, that, in this loop I'm saying, declare a, a starting number, go through this loop until the starting number is less, is less than than the length and at the end of each iteration, increment that starting number. So this should loop through every single element in that array and print it out to the console. Should. And then why is it? Yeah, I'm having more. So my internet's down for one second. Let's give it a minute. Sorry, what was your question? Back. How'd you know I was back on? I'm not following. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I don't think it's the internet. Okay. It just might be down for a second. Good point. Okay. Um, so, yeah, loop through that array and print it out the results. So, this is extremely powerful if you have. Um, a list of something and you want to do something, maybe it's you have a list of customers and you want to add a discount to each customer, or you have a list of items in a shopping cart and you want to add them up. This is really where arrays come into play. One quick note to understand about JavaScript is it's uh, very loose in its interpretation of types. Uh, so. It will try to uh, convert the type if it thinks it should. So here's a great example. We have an uh, initial number 10. So that, what type is that? It's a, it's a yeah, number, right? Um, so if I, this is actually important. Type of is an operator. Type of is an operator that will tell you what the type of your variable is. 
So if I change this to a string instead of number, it'll say string. So in this case, we have an initial number that's set to the integer 10, so that's a number. We then add initial number to the string 5. So JavaScript says, oh, that's not a number. I'm assuming you're going to add two, concatenate two strings together. So if I do a console.log on, on the sum, it'll say 10, 5, the character's 10, F, I, V, E. And then the, the type is now a string. So it infers the type and changes it for me. So that's useful, but it can also be dangerous because you could be doing something with your variables and then the type changes and you don't know it. So that's why that type of operator is extremely valuable in inspecting uh, what your variable actually is. And all you have to do is just put a typo and then your variable anywhere else. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> go ahead. So that's, that's a good point. So in, in static programming languages, the compiler checks all the types and before it compiles and makes sure everything is what it should be. In JavaScript, you don't have that. So oftentimes in, um, at the beginning of like subroutines or functions or methods, you'll want to check and be like, OK, did someone actually pass me a number? If not, throw an exception. So it's almost like checking combined with error handling. It blows up the program, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we talked about um, variables, and I, variables are sort of like nouns. If you, if you take a look at uh, natural language, um, it's analogous to nouns. Operators are a lot like verbs. They do things to variables. So let's go back in this example. That plus sign is an operator. It acts on two variables and does something to them. In this case, it's either adding numbers or it's concatenating strings. That equal sign is an operator. It's assigning a variable to another variable. It's taking an action. There are many different types of, of operators. We're not going to go through each of them because we would be here for the next four or five hours understanding them. But it is good to have a reference and at least know that each um, sort of type has different variables associated with it. And there's really five different types of operators. Um, arithmetic, which we just saw an example of with plus. You can do minus, you can do multiplication, you can do division. Um, assignment, uh, there's different types of assignment variables. We looked at the equals as one example. Um, there's different types of string operators, um, comparison logical, and then type operators. So we saw type of as one example of a type operator. Um, here's a link to a very um, comprehensive reference of different um, operators. Um, you don't need, ever need to use all of them. Um, a lot of them are really just kind of fancy syntax. Some of them are necessary. We'll be covering most of the necessary ones throughout uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, but just kind of have reference and know what they are. So if you ever need to look up how to do something, um, this would be a good reference for that. OK, so there's another kind of verb in JavaScript. And it's the kind that you can create. Operators are native to JavaScript. If you can't find something you want done in an operator, you can create your own function to do it. And this is the real power of JavaScript. The functional aspect uh, and the ability to define your own actions makes it an extremely um, powerful language. So let's take a look at a simple variable. Um, let's go into JS Fiddle. Let's get rid of this. So functions just like um, everything else in JavaScript is just an object. So let's create an object. Um, so first I declare the variable. And instead of assigning it a value, I'm assigning it a function call. And that function takes a parameter, which is the input to that function. Um, in this case, I'll just call it um, uh, first number. 
you can call it whatever you want. And, I'm, and whatever I pass into that function, I'm going to multiply it by itself. I'm going to create another variable just to make it a little bit more readable. And then I'm going to return that result outside of the function. So the, the up right here is the input to my function. Here's the output. And so now that I've declared it, I'm actually going to call it. And I'm going to store that in a variable. And then I'm going to log that out to make sure it's doing what I think it <coughs> should be doing. Couldn't you console that log the actual function? Yeah, you could. So uh, I'll show an example of that. This is just more for readability and to understand like what's being returned where. OK. So it worked. It, it was 9. But yeah, to, to your point, I could have just done square numbers and not stored it in a variable. And it would do the same thing. And so what's great about this is I can reuse this function. Once I've declared it, and when I said, when I said functions were powerful, this reuse is the power of it. I can declare a function and make it general and pass different types of input parameters to it uh, and get different results back. So I'm not writing lots of code to do the same sort of thing over and over again. Anytime you look at your code and you see things that look very similar, you can almost always combine it into a function and change the input parameters and achieve the same thing. Questions on functions? When, when you're developing an application, then are you always aiming to create as, as, want to create as many functions as you possibly can to separate them to be, make it more modular, or do you try to create a... Okay, so... You said two things there. Do you want to create as many functions as you can? Not if you don't need to. But do you want to use functions to make things more modular? Yes. That's exactly um, one of the reasons to create functions. Just a question on nesting, because um, I know that sometimes gets a little confusing. Yeah. Sure. As far as like, how they're nested and why, and like, what variables you can use and what variables you can't use within. Sure. So uh, what you're referring to is the idea of scope. Yeah. So let's um, give me a variable name. Uh, pizza. OK. No one's hungry. <laughs> OK, so we have a variable called pizza. Let's now create a function. Um, Let's create a, a variable inside of that function called pizza and say, um, let's now call that function and output the result. What do you think that'll equal? Mushroom. Why? Why well, won't it use this one? The reason why I won't use it is because it's using the, if you call a function, it's going to 
use whatever variables are within that function? Are most local to that function. So I could keep doing this and create another function in, in within here. And it would be exactly. That yeah. So. Yes. Dinner. Yep. But if you want to get, say, another value in your, in your inner function, you have to just call that in the function, or that function. Does that make so let's say, let's say I take, get rid of this. What will this now say? Cheese. Yep. So it's because there's no local one, it goes a, a level above and says, it looks for the local first, and then, and then looks for the one above it, and then the one above it, and then the one above it, until it gets to the top. And if it can't find anything at the, at the global level, it throws an exception and says, this variable doesn't exist. Okay. So it's, it's, yeah. okay, so almost like that could almost reverse. If, like, if there was nothing that was called, if there's nothing that's called in a local function, then it would kind of revert to the local. Yes, and there are actual patterns around this. We're going to cover, possibly cover some of those in the next session, there's, um, there's certain um, things you can do because of that global, kind of like clever uh, design patterns okay. that are very useful. Cool. Have you ever encountered applications where there were lots of global variables? Yeah, so in general, you want to stay away from global variables because they have unintended consequences. And it, it's called polluting the global namespace. If there's a whole bunch of global variables, um, let me give you a, a, another good example of this. If I don't, so I assume this is even more. So I, if I say pizza, what does this do? Equals. Um, What did that just do? I forgot to put var in front of it, so I forgot to declare a local one. What's going to happen there? It's going to just kind of change it to pepperoni. At the global level. At the global level. Right? So if anyone else is using that global variable, I just changed it in my function, and now it's going to affect everyone else and every other function that uses it. Uh, so for one, just as a rule, always declare var, which says create a new variable and try not to use global variables. There's times where you should use global variables, um, but you just want to be careful with it. Okay. And functions are a way to, again, modularize and encapsulate that functionality um, so that you don't run into this conflict. So has anyone ever seen that website, Is It Friday? OK, so you visit it every day of the week. It has a big red no unless it's Friday and it has a green yes. Very useful website. Um, so I just wrote the exact same program in JavaScript. So let's go through this kind of statement by statement and understand what's happening. So the first statement is a function, and that's this. And it's getting the day of the week. So this will return. Monday, if it's Monday, today it would turn, return Saturday. So here I'm calling that function, storing it in a variable. That's another statement. Then I'm doing what's called a um, Boolean branching there. It was either yes or no. But I could also do it, um, else if, um, if it's Saturday. If I didn't have any syntax errors, OK. So here I was checking for another value called Saturday. And I could have called other functions here. I could have branched into other programs. Uh, it's really a way to um, go down a different path based on the state of your program or your variables. Or based on input that you're using. Exactly, yeah. So maybe a user logs in and they're an administrator. You'd have an if-else statement that says, are you the administrator? OK, pop up the admin dashboard. Are you not? OK, pop up the regular user 
experience. Yeah, so and that's so anytime you're sort of measuring or evaluating state, you're typically looking at an object that has properties on it and basing it off the value of those properties. Is it just more secure doing that, doing it that way compared to just putting it in a variable or Well, it's not security, it's more um just um logic. Yeah, it's and it's more um uh Typically when I'm working in JavaScript programs, I have complex objects that are, it's, it's grouping. It's like everything in my user is in my user object. So if they're an admin, that's maybe a, prop, a Boolean property. Um, their username might be a string property. So it's a simple way to pass things around um, instead of just having all these like kind of variables all over the place to keep track of things. And that's kind of when you get into more object-oriented programming, which we will be covering that within JavaScript in the second session. Sort of some patterns around that. Looping is another uh, really important thing in JavaScript or just programming in general. We took a look at an example of a for loop. Um, let's go ahead and look at the while loop as well. Um, I think there's a JS fiddle on looping. Let's check. <coughs> hmm. So this is running a little slow, so we'll just go to the slide. So you have the example in front of you. Uh, so in this scenario, um, we do the same multiply by two function that we did earlier. Um, and we're gonna take the current number and set it to one, and then loop through current number until, um, we're gonna loop through it 100 times. So basically, um, until this multiply by two is greater than 100, then stop. So it should go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and then stop, because the next one would be more than 100. Are you able to run that? OK. So basically, you're saying that the current number, it, it has to stay under 100. Less than 100, and once it meets that scenario, break out of the loop. Okay. So in the for loop, we said, go through each element until we get to a size that's larger than the elements. And this one, it's not really element-based or series-based. It's more like a single number. So we, so we use a while loop. It's just testing to see yeah. if it meets the condition. Yep. How often, I mean, how often do you typically use that in an application? Yeah, um, I, I, all the time. All the time. Yeah, um, it's typically if you're, um, I mean, you can use them with arrays. You can say, do this in an array while the number is less than the length. Right. So it's an alternative to four. Um, but there's also just examples where you don't have an array or you don't have a series and you need to do something until a number reaches zero or reaches a certain amount. Okay. Uh, there's two other conditional statements that uh, I just want to talk about. You saw return in the function call. Return just means stop executing this function and return whatever value, or no value, just return. Um, and it won't execute any of the code below it at that point. And then throw, um, we talked about exceptions. Let's say something's going wrong in your program, you can, you can do a throw statement, which stops the execution um, and tells either what called that function, that there's a problem, or it could actually stop the program entirely if you don't catch it. You don't need to know the details of this, just know that those are other sorts of statements you can work into your programs. So let's, let's um, that's a good example. Let's go to, um, sorry. Okay. Right, cause you, so it just said stop the program, something's really wrong. And then if you're expecting that throw to happen somewhere, like in a function, you can catch it so that it doesn't go all the way to the top and um, terminate the program. It catches it and then you do some error handling based on that. So maybe, maybe your um, wireless connection is disconnected and you say, I'm doing a service call, 
oh, I'm catching the um, service not available exception. OK, catch it, and now show the user. Tell them the network's down. Please try again. So we talked a little bit about these analogies of spoken language. This helps me kind of understand uh, programming languages when I'm learning a new one. So data types are really like nouns. Um, they are. Um, they're both data types and variables are like nouns. Variables could be like pronouns because it's like a marker. Like you, it's like a. You could say, Dave did this. He. Now you can refer to it as he throughout the rest of the paragraph. That's kind of like a variable, right? So, so the actual value is Dave, yeah. and then he is the variable. So, so it's proper nouns. Or just anything, like it. It could be, um, I, um, I have water, it is cold. It would be the variable there. And I had you say operated by like verbs or not. <laughs> So no, you're right. So so functions and operators. You you write your own functions. So it's I put the focus there. But functions and operators are both actions. So they're like verbs, uh, and then statements are composed of all of those things. So they're like sentences. So would, you, would it be safe to say like an operator is technically a function? It's not a function. So functions are you define. They're user user defined. Um, operators are built into language. They do, there are ways to do that. You need to be very careful about doing that because if you override the plus symbol, it's going to override it for everyone else. So you need a really good reason to do something like that. OK, so we've talked about JavaScript. Let's kind of take a step back. We mentioned before that JavaScript doesn't have to be run in the browser. Um, it's really a uh, sort of general purpose programming language. Um, but the reality is it is often run in the browser. And because of that, it's, it's useful to take a look at um, HTML and how it interacts with JavaScript. Uh, so here's an example of just a kind of basic HTML document. Um, you'll notice it's, it's very nested. Uh, there's sort of a body. Um, and then there are, there's a header. Um, there's sections within that body. Uh, and then there's sort of like paragraphs and um, maybe even nested sections within those sections. So you can kind of see it as something like this, almost like a hierarchy of a document. And this is what's called the document object model. And there's ways for JavaScript to access individual boxes within that model. So maybe you want to animate one thing on your web page. There's a way to tell JavaScript, get the third text box um, that's in the body that's inside of this div. So it's very, you're getting a specific object that you want. So this is actually very painful in JavaScript, but there is a utility out there that helps. Um, another big part of the um, document object model are events. So let's take a button, for example. Let's go back to this here. Um, a button could exist somewhere on your document object model. You get access to it and say, when it's clicked, run this JavaScript function. Here's, there's on load. There's when a form submitted, um, on scroll. These are all events that you can hook into with JavaScript. But then you have to type that. You have to put that on the actual DOM, like HTML, right? Yeah, and we'll, we'll run that. Can you run, like, uh, on scroll within JavaScript? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You can hook onto the on scroll of, say, the body of your HTML page. So anytime it scrolls, you run some kind of function. Okay. So if you've ever seen those ads that like keep scrolling down, they're probably using something similar to that. Okay. So I mentioned that DOM manipulation can be a little bit painful in JavaScript. jQuery is a utility that makes it much easier. So let's take an example of what jQuery does for us. So in the top box here, we have some HTML. Um, so you see it's, it's nested. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a DOM hierarchy to it. But there's these IDs here. So if you see in that first text box, there's a first name, and then next to it is a last name text box. If you look at the um, JavaScript, uh, so there's a JS fiddle for this as well.
says jQuery example. So again, here's my HTML. I create a function that uses this dollar sign me is like a jQuery function. And that jQuery function takes a parameter of an ID or some sort of selector. So is everyone familiar with CSS selectors? I saw CSS in a lot of the email responses. So pound means the ID. You could do class, which would be dot. You can do um, um, narrowing. You could do first name and then the first element within uh, first name. So this is a jQuery function that says, give me the value of this text box, store it in a variable. Now give me the value of the second text box, store it in another variable, and append it to the results div right here. Is it possible to grab multiple selectors within the query? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How would you do that? Uh, if, if you do, it, it does it kind of automatically. If, if your criteria um, uh, is fulfilled by multiple elements on the page, it'll give you an array instead of a single element. So, so you may want to check the type of, and then, although if you, there's, there's jQuery functions that sort of do that for you. So you, you, couldn't, you couldn't just say, like, hey, uh, first name would equal the dollar sign. It would be a query, and it would be your ID of first name and your ID of last name within that same parentheses. No, because there's nothing, there's not one element that has both first name and last name, so that would return null. Um, but you could say, so I think I put a class on these. Oh, well, I'll put a class on them. So, so let's say there's a class called text box. And let's say I wanted to make all the text boxes on my page red when validation doesn't work. I could then do um, dot instead of number sign, and then do for each some sort of function that makes them red. So the, the dollar sign is, we would sort of collectively just invoking the jQuery function. function. It's, dollar sign is really just a JavaScript function. Okay. And it takes a parameter of the selector. Once you, uh, when it finds something in that selector, it returns the object. So you now have a reference to that object. So you can attach click handlers to it. You can apply styles to it. You can do anything you could normally do with HTML. So before, let me get rid of this real quick. So if I did this correct, when I hit submit, it should call the display name function and run, get access to these text boxes and append it to the end of the document. And it does. So it's a little bit of a contrived example, but it gives you an understanding of how JavaScript can kind of reach into HTML um, get values from it, and also manipulate that HTML. Questions on jQuery? Um, with jQuery, is it just mostly user interface, or is there other areas within jQuery that you use? That is a great transition. So its main purpose is interaction with HTML, but there are some utilities sort of attached to it that are very useful as well. All right, so web services and AJAX. Um, so AJAX is basically a way to um, get outside data from other applications. So maybe I'm writing a, um, a weather application, and I need to get access to data about locations and cities. Um, I can use a web service call, call an application that is already good at doing that, get that data returned to me, uh, and then do what I'm good at, which is weather so that I'm not doing all the data 
storing and database manipulation myself. I'm using other applications that have expertise. So AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, uh, which is a little bit of a misnomer because you don't have to use XML. You can use JSON and you don't have to use, it doesn't have to be asynchronous. But the name was just very clever and it's really taken hold. So just know that that's what it means and that it's not really what it says. So I, before we talked about the dollar sign, um, there's a, let's go into JS Fiddle. There's a fiddle for this one. I think, yes. Okay, so in this scenario, um, you see the dollar sign here. This tells us we're using jQuery. But instead of doing a selector, I'm saying J, uh, dollar sign dot Ajax. I'm telling it what URL I want to get my data from. And then I'm doing exactly what I did with my first name, last name application and appending that data uh, to the bottom here. So does anyone have a, a um, stock ticker? Try ADS. ADS, what is ADS? Alliance data. System. Alliance data, okay. Their stock price is 249.22. Another one? DAL. DAL? 46.75. So what it's doing is, I don't have this data in my application at all. I don't have a database of stock prices. Um, all I have is really some JavaScript and a JS fiddle. It's jumping out to an application, in this case, finance.google.com, which has all that data. So I just pass it a stock ticker uh, symbol, and I get back the price. Can we have, uh, well, with the stock ticker symbol, how do you know? Do you go on to like, their website, basically, and try to find out if that variable is called stock ticker? So that's, OK, great. That's, so, so first of all, I did some research and said, who has a stock ticker API? I then found, yeah. So just to explain how, well, let's do this. So I found some documentation that said, hit this URL, we'll do Microsoft stock. Um, put this these query parameters in here where Q is the name of your stock ticker symbol. So I get back this plain text. Remember that JavaScript object notation we talked about before? It returns the data in a service as JavaScript object notation. And when I looked at the documentation, it said um, this, this L um, property is your price. So I just take that string. I parse it, I look for that L. It's actually an array, if you'll notice. It's an array that has one object in it. It's kind of a weird data format. So I take the array, I take the zeroth element, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, oops. So I call this Ajax call. I get back an array. I take the zero with object, and I know the dot L property is what I'm looking for, and I display that to the screen. So it does exactly what I just did in the browser, behind the scenes, parse the data, show it to the user. Yeah, I just wanted to see that part. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. It's a, it's really it's really simple. It's it's a it's it's the web, right? It's yeah. HTTP. That comes back? Sure, absolutely. So let's do that right now. So um, console.log. So it would be our response data, which of zero. Response data is an array. We could start with just response data. Let's do that. Let's start there. So it would have to be within the success property of zero? Yeah. So here it's telling me I have this, whenever you see object in um, square brackets, it's an array. So it tells me I have an array. And then it tells me I just have an object. So that's that name value pair we talked about earlier. And that object has a L property on it. So I can see all the properties here. I can see, okay, E must be the um, uh, index exchange. And, yeah, exactly. 
Um, I have some high-low prices here. I have the date of um, when it was last open, which was this Friday. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just I, I was trying to figure out. It's like, well, I want to know what the option looks like in console.log because it's, it's formatted. So. Right. And that's the beauty of console.log is you console.log an object, and it lets you drill down yeah. and look at the structure of that object. Yes. And the way I figured that out is I looked up the jQuery um, sort of API and what functions it expects and what functions it calls on a success on an error. So you see this error function. Um, in the documentation, it says this gets called when, um, the, when something goes wrong. So, so I should be able to, there was an error retrieving the price. So I didn't pass it a, a parameter. The service blew up. Um, and it threw this error function. So that's a way to compensate for um, when something goes wrong. It's kind of like that throw yeah. example we talked about earlier. Yeah. So, um, so which ones? I, I know there's git JSON. Mm -hmm. Yeah, git is like the easiest, uh, dollar sign dot git. Yeah, so that's if, if you're on the same domain, you can do that. The sec I'm going outside of the domain, so in this case the domain is jsfiddle.net, but I'm hitting um, finance.google.com domain, uh, so I need to use a format called jsonp, um, which is why I use dollar sign dot ajax. Okay, because it automatically uses that, well, you already put that format. Yeah. Yeah, and I, sorry, and I, I specified the data type. Uh, if you're on your own domain, you don't have to do any of that. You can just do a dot .git. Yep, yeah, and so the way you find that out is you get this weird error cross-origin error back, and you look it up, and you say, why is this not working? And then and somewhere in the jQuery documentation, it says you need to use this JSONP format. No, those implementation details are important. Any other questions on AJAX or talking to other applications with JavaScript or talking to the DOM or jQuery in general? Okay, so let's now just talk about what we've gone over. We're going to jump into an exercise. Um, we've looked at just kind of the core of the JavaScript language. We covered probably only 20% or 10% of JavaScript, but probably 90% of, of the constructs that are used in programs. We didn't look at a lot of the edge cases and um, exotic parts of the language that are rarely used. We looked at the core of it. Um, then we took a look at how to interact with HTML um, and kind of make JavaScript a little bit more useful and not just contained uh, to its own application. Uh, and then we, we saw how we could make that easier with jQuery. Uh, and then within jQuery, we saw how we could use Ajax to talk to other applications. So let's all kind of do, try to build something together. Um, this is a fairly simple example, but it uses every single thing that we just learned. So let's build a to-do list. And I'm going to code it, and you guys can code it as well, um, but I'm not going to actually do any of the work. I'm going to have you guys help me um, do this. So that... JS Lint stuff was really scaring me, so I'm going to do it just in, in a text editor here. Yes. Uh, maybe. Any Mac people out there know how? It's like command yeah. command up. Command plus. Yeah, we might want to do that, actually. Ooh. Probably should have done that from the beginning. <laughs> All right. So in, um, there is a JS fiddle out there for the HTML portion of this, which should look like this. And it's called to do. So 
So let's take a look at actually let's try to do it in JSLint first because the HTML is there. It's easy. Okay, so I have some real basic HTML, okay? It's a input box and a button, and I want to be able to create tasks that I can add and remove. So when I first start writing a program, I like to think about different actions that can be taken and break out my objects and functions into those tasks. So what's one thing I need to be able to do? Okay, so let's create a function called add. We'll make it empty for now. Let's just define what we need to do. We'll call it add, let's call it add item to be a little bit more specific. What else do I need? If I'm adding, I probably want to remove too. How am I going to keep track of my to-do list items? What's a good data structure for that? I heard a couple of different things. Yeah, I think that's probably, it makes sense since it's a list of the same kind of thing. So we'll do to-do items equals, and I'm really bad about semicolons. JavaScript's pretty good about putting semicolons after your statements. Um, it can infer where the semicolons should go, but it's a good practice to put them where they should go. Okay, so I have this data structure, um, and I have these methods to add them and remove them, but I probably want to write the output to um, using jQuery or something to the, the DOM. So let's just call that function write HTML. Oh yeah, in both of them. Thank you. Anytime you see that, let me know because I probably will have some syntax errors. Right. This is this is like pairing. All right. So what else do we need? So let's start with the add item. Um, We're going to get our item from this text box, right? So let's do, let's do some jQuery here. Um, it looks like the ID of that text box is called task. And we want to get the value of it. And then we're going to put that in our array. And there's a special um, function on an array called push, which puts that item on the array. It adds it to the array as the last element. <coughs> and then whenever I add something new to my array, I want to write it back out to the screen so that the, the array and the screen are sort of synchronized. So let's just, before we do everything else, let's just try to do just that. So uh, in my write HTML function, here's where it'll get a little bit complex. We're going to do that one of those loops. So this is going to be my HTML. And I'm going to say for every single item in my array, I called my array to do items dot length.
plus equals is a um, shorthand for saying whatever it was before, just add this to it. So it doesn't erase what, what was in that variable before, it concatenates to the end of it. So we're going to create, I don't know, we'll create a, a div. I'm going to type this out and then explain it. But what you're essentially doing is you're just, you're holding those elements in that variable, right? Yeah, I'm holding the, so I have an array, right. and then I'm looping through it and writing the contents of that array right. to an HTML string, and then I'm going to display that to the user. And you'll use an append to do that? So this is append. This plus equals is the append. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's looping through it and then appending that. Let me just look at this and make sure it's right. Just for consistency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I probably do want to do that. All right, um, good call. Good catch. And then another one at the end of it. Good catch. I know. So let's see what I messed up here. Uh, I have not. Good call. So I clicked that button and nothing happened. So that means I never registered that click event. So the button has an ID of add. And when I hit click, what, what function do I want to call? No, I put click button outside of everything. Uh, you're right, but I just noticed that this, the closing tag for button that's missing uh, right here. Yeah. Oh, good call. This is the messiest part right here. Once we get over this, we'll be good. Um, I'll, I'll uh, make that a little bit bigger even. Is there any other way we could do that other than writing out the string? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a very dirty example. Um, you would definitely want to um, do less string concatenation in real life. That takes more code. and. So let's see if that worked. Oh, I need to run this. Absolutely.
it's double, double quote, quote then single quote to end that string. Uh, and I'm going to post the the if you, if you get lost somewhere along the way, I'm going to post the final code for this. And, and when we hit run, what when you hit run, nothing yet. It should just load load the screen. Um, so let's see what I messed up. Mm, you're right. That's okay. So I'm going to use jQuery again to actually write it to the screen. Is everyone else having connectivity issues with the uh, JS fiddle, or is it just me? Um, I think that's all of it, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. So uh, to recap what we've done so far, we have uh, our, our array of to-do items. We have an add method that will take whatever is in this text box and add it to this to-do items array. We also have a function to write this stuff out to the screen, which is called write HTML. Um, it builds a to-do HTML string of, and it loops through the array and concatenates it into HTML. So I can, if I have multiple things in my array, we'll put um, teach class. So my, my array has one item in it, and when I call write HTML, um, it adds it to the bottom of the screen. I could also say, um, um, So if it's not, and if it's not working, open up your um, console dot, your uh, debugger tools, and take a look at if there's any errors in there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not efficient, right? But it's, it gets the job done. Yeah, you're right. So that's, you can always look at a program and say, like, okay, now that I've written it, how can I optimize it? Yeah. That way, it wouldn't, if I put it inside, it wouldn't concatenate. It would overwrite it every time. So it would create a new variable. Oh, yeah. Yep.
Yeah, is anyone else stuck or getting an error that doesn't make sense? Yeah. So who? Yeah, okay. Um, I can just, I can write, we'll put that on. We'll, we'll put this on Slack. Uh, which Slack channel is it? This one? Let's see if that works. So this is the right HTML function. So if we just, if you take that and replace what you have, it should work. It's, it's basic, but it has loops, it has functions, it has variables, it has statements. It has every single thing we covered. Why don't we go from line uh, 13 to 17? Shoot, hold on. I, I forgot. Add a, add a semicolon at the end. I'll, I'll post it as well. Okay. Or not a semicolon, but a, a curly bracket. Are you getting an uh, error in the console? And you hit run too, right? Yeah, oh yeah, hit run. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, run will execute, will execute that code, which will attach that click event and everything related to it. So I knew this would take about 30 minutes, so we're not running behind at all. Just, this is part of the fun of programming, is you think you have it, and then one little thing is off, and yeah. you kind of have to scour through your debugger and find what it is. Sometimes it's not 30 minutes, sometimes it's Yeah, sometimes it's a week. Yeah. Ignore that. Ignore this for now. We're going to talk about this. When I say this, I mean literally this. Because it's a special um, parameter within functions. Uh, we want to go to our array and get rid of that element. Arrays have uh, a, a method called splice, which will take the element position and remove this many. So in this case, if it's the zeroth element, it'll go to the, the first element in the array and remove one. If it's the first element, it'll go to the first element, remove that one. If I wanted to remove more, I could put two or three in there, but I really just want to remove the element I tell it to remove. Can we use slice instead of splice, or splice, or are there two different? Um, so off the top of my head, I'm not recalling what slice does, but splice, I know, it does a removal. Okay. So now that I've done that, I need to update the screen so I can just simply call write HTML again. On these, on these buttons, I want to attach this remove function to it. So I've written the function now. Yeah, they have an X like as a like as a text. It's showing X, but it doesn't the X doesn't do anything. So how would I attach this to that button. Yep, so let's use jQuery. What did I call that button, that remove button? Um, I called it, so it's a class. There's more than one of them, so I need to use dot instead of the hashtag. 
and I'm going to say for all the buttons that have the remove class on them, put this click event on them. Like I said before, I'll be around to, to come help people, but just to close this out. Um, here are some of the uh, really great resources to go sort of the next step. We'll be covering a little bit of um, uh, what's in these books in the next 
uh, session on Saturday, next Saturday. Um, some of these are more references. Um, some of these are more advanced, like the um, uh, JavaScript, the good parts. Um, I would consider that intermediate to advanced, um, whereas the definitive guide is more of a reference. You probably won't read that book, but as you're having, um, as you want to look things up, it's a great uh, place to go. And then Eloquent JavaScript is very um, straightforward, explaining a lot of the um, beginner to intermediate concepts um, in um, uh, a really easy to understand way. So I would recommend that one first. And I used all of these as, as um, research uh, for this. Um, there's a couple other online resources that are really useful. There's a site called JS Books. Um, that has a whole bunch of online books for free on JavaScript. Um, each of them sort of focus on a, a different area of the language. And then there's w3schools.com, which is more of a reference. Uh, and then there's the Mozilla Developer Network JavaScript Guide. Uh, these are all resources I use probably every day. Um, so general questions on anything we covered? There has to be at least one question out there. Yeah. When you come back on next Saturday, having gotten the correct code for Gatorade, yep. and what I'm doing is I'm copy and pasting my, my bad code that's not working. Sure. So I can do like, oh, I'm not on the Yeah. When we get back into class, could we start the class by kind of um, reading through it and saying, this, is, this relates to this piece up here, and then sure. this relates to this piece up here, so you can, because for me, I am the epitome of beginner with this. Sure. So Absolutely. And I knew this would be about a 30 minute exercise and so, so none of this was unexpected. So that, you bring up a good point. Um, what do we want to talk about um, next week? So going over the program would be something to talk about. Uh, what else did we not cover? I have a whole agenda planned, but I can be agile and put things in and take things out if you guys have something you really want to hear about. Switch, okay, so another, another, so switch cases is another statement construct. Um, what else? I dive into the loops, the different types of loops. Okay. Can you mention something about patterns? So patterns is, I have a whole hours and hours of patterns. So we can cover patterns uh, for sure. That was the plan. That's definitely going to be in there. Okay. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So we can do that. Um, do you actually want to dive into real wor world code? Um, it's it goes. It's hard to do introductory courses on on actual code because it's a lot more complex than what we saw there. You can do that. Maybe it's like one, of the one of the beauties of JavaScript is you can go to any web page you want. You can go to you know, google.com and look at their code. Um, maybe we should actually take a look at how to do that real quick. Um, any other things you'd like to cover? Yeah, we can, we can definitely at least do a summary of what it does, why it's there. Um, so in any website you go to, you can open up the, um, we'll do this, we'll do view source. Um, we'll do developer tools. So in the developer tools, you can go to the sources tab. And Google might be a bad example because I'm sure they minify their JavaScript. But you can actually look at what JavaScript is out there. Is there a way you can kind of uncompact it and decompress it? Yeah, there are programs to sort of unminify. Um, but not all sites do this. So there's ways you can go to a site and just kind of look at the JavaScript. Yeah. So that's one way to look at real world examples. Whenever I see a page doing something and I think, wow, that's pretty cool how they do that, I go into the JavaScript and see what they're doing. Anything else we want to cover for next week? Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sure, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll start off like the first like 30 minutes covering the program, um, reviewing. It, reviewing, talking more about it just so we can get caught back up to speed, and then we'll go over patterns and some of the more advanced things. Okay, great. Um, so you can look at that program for one, and just kind of do your own reading, and as you come up, come up with questions, uh, maybe write another program. Um, it's really up to you, but probably explore a little bit more, and if you come back with, why does this work this way, um, we should be able to help with that. All right. Thank you, John.